the School of International Service at American University in Washington, this is Big World, where we talk about something in the world that truly matters. The modern state of Israel dates back to just 1948, but the nation has long been regarded as the only functional democracy in the Middle East. Democracy, however, isn't a fixed state. It must be maintained by its people. When that doesn't happen and the democratic qualities of a political regime decline, observers call it democratic backsliding. The list of democratic nations thought to be backsliding is long, and it must be noted includes the United States. Israel, though, has always faced unique challenges to its democracy, including its hostile security environment or the so-called tough neighborhood of the Middle East it inhabits, the intrinsic role of religion to its politics, and its ongoing struggles to balance the rights of the nation's sizable Palestinian minority. But blames for recent claims that Israel is a democratic backslider are typically laid at the feet of one man, Benjamin Netanyahu. At this point, at least to outsiders, his political identity seems almost inseparable from the nation he leads. So today we're talking about Israel, Israel's prime minister, and Israel's democracy. I'm Kay Summers, and I'm joined by Guy Ziv. Guy is a professor in the School of International Service and the associate director of American University's Meltzer Schwartzberg Center for Israeli Israel Studies. Excuse me. He teaches U.S. foreign policy, U.S. Israel relations, and Israeli Palestinian peacemaking. And he writes and researches foreign policy decision making, civil military relations in Israel, and the role of leaders' personalities in foreign policy change. Guy has also worked in policy at the U.S. Department of State and on Capitol Hill. Guy, thanks for joining Big World. My pleasure. Happy to be back. Yes. Guy, the last time you were on the podcast, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's upbringing and his political career through the early days. Listeners, the episode is titled The Netanyahu Effect. And if you haven't listened to it, it's a great starting point to better understand Netanyahu's career. Guy, despite earlier signs that Netanyahu's career might have been in trouble, he was reelected again in November of 2022. What do you think explains Netanyahu's incredible political longevity? Well, I may have said this in the previous uh, podcast. I don't recall, but Netanyahu is a political magician. Uh, this is something that's been said about him for decades, and I think it's true. He's He's a consummate politician with a killer instinct. He wants this job more than anyone else in Israel. And he's always in campaign mode. Um, in his campaigns, there are no red lines. So any and all means are acceptable. He uh, Even the first time he ran uh, for prime minister in 96, he was challenging the incumbent Shimon Peres, and he came up with a slogan Paris will divide Jerusalem, which uh, which had no bearing in reality. Um, and then in 2015, he came up with a difference. It wasn't actually a slogan. It was a uh, kind of a robocall uh, to his supporters where he announced that the Arabs are, are voting in droves come to the polls, uh, which also was not was not the case. And uh, President Obama called him out on the kind of racist implications of that line uh, at the time. So so he's. Um, always in campaign mode, and he more recently brought into the Knesset and into his cabinet extremists like Itamar Ben-Gvir, who uh, otherwise would have been left on the margins of Israeli society. Uh, but he felt that he needed to bring all of these elements in in order to have a shot at forming a coalition, which, of course, uh, we know he was able to do. Um, he also has long had an obsessive focus on the media. Um, he's, he has this ability to manipulate the media as no one else can do. And in fact, uh, that's one of the uh, sources of his corruption scandals is precisely that. Um, it, it involves the media, it involves um, allegedly uh, bribing, blackmailing, and, and manipulating uh, various media outlets uh, for favorable coverage. And he has managed to create a solid religious right block, this alliance that, despite periodic tensions and various threats, um, has meant that his Likud party can pretty much automatically count on the ultra-Orthodox parties as coalition partners, as well as the other uh, religious parties. 
But aside from Netanyahu, the politician, he also has some significant structural advantages working for him. So most Israelis uh, identify as right wing. And this has been the case ever since the uh, second intifada uh, over two decades ago. He um, He's dealing with a situation in which the Arab dominated parties have long refused to join any Israeli government. And so that further narrows the options, the coalition prospects for any of his center left uh, opponents. And and also we know that right wing and religious voters do tend to vote in higher numbers than their secular and liberal counterparts. So these are kind of built in advantages, uh, structural advantages that uh, that he has uh, for him. There definitely seem to be some similarities between the far religious, the far right religious voters in Israel and those in the U.S. And something else that perhaps uh, one of our figures has in common with Benjamin Netanyahu. Let's talk about indictments uh, in Israel. Netanyahu is currently facing a litany of charges, including fraud, bribery and breach of trust charges. He's denied these allegations. His trial began in 2020. And it remains ongoing. And he was reelected regardless of that. In the U.S., former U.S. President Donald Trump has been indicted on four different occasions with charges ranging from falsifying business records to illegally retaining and storing classified documents and including charges of conspiring to defraud the U.S. by overturning the results of the 2020 election. And his various trials may start next spring. In Trump's case, these various indictments against him seem to spur his base of supporters to more ardently support and fund him. And so far, his support among GOP voters seems unaffected. And obviously, Netanyahu was reelected in the midst of his own legal troubles. So I'm wondering if you can give us some context for how Netanyahu's situation is similar or different from Trump's, both in terms of the substance of the charges but also how the charges and trials have impacted Israel's democracy and how the Israeli public has reacted to these charges. Do they care? Well, I think the parallels here are are striking. And of course, the substance of the charges are are, are somewhat different. Mm -hmm. But um, what we're seeing in, in both cases is kind of a cult of personality. Both men have a hold on their respective political parties. They are both strongly attuned to their political base. They continuously engage in populist and divisive rhetoric, and they've effectively used their uh, criminal investigations and and indictments to rally support. And uh, they seek to portray themselves as victims of the deep state. Mm. And, uh, And neither men, as we've seen, has hesitated to undermine democracy and the rule of law uh, as they see fit. And so uh, as with Trump in, in the U.S., none of none of this has really impacted support for Netanyahu um, from his ardent backers, at least as far as ardent backers are concerned. And I think the same goes with, with Trump in the U.S. So despite the developments of the, of the investigations and, and the ongoing trial in Netanyahu's case, Most Israelis have by now made up their minds about Netanyahu, and there's really little that can be revealed at this point about Netanyahu's alleged corruption that's going to sway either his supporters or detractors. That's that's kind of interesting, that that sort of locked in opinion that people have. And it, it seems to be something that happens when you have when you have leaders who have been around this long, or when you have personalities who have been around this long in the public consciousness, it's almost as though nothing that they might be accused of could affect anybody's opinion of them. It it it, it it's kind of I don't know, but that feels like a pretty late breaking type of of opinion. You know, we can picture a time forty fifty years ago when charges like the charges that have been laid against either of these leaders would have been career ending. Do do you have any thoughts on the similarities, whether it's in the media landscape, as you mentioned, uh, Netanyahu is really good at kind of demonizing the media as Trump is. What is it that has changed in Israel, at least, to allow uh, 
people who say they are voting on the basis of you know religion and morality to so ardently support someone who's accused of serious crimes? A lot of this is uh, kind of a cultural battle. And mm-hmm. again, we, we see similar patterns here in the States with a very polarized uh, voting population. And, mm-hmm. and, and in Israel, that's been the case for a while. Netanyahu actually uh, thrives in terms of using divisive political tactics to rally his supporters. And, uh, and we've seen, of course, Trump do the same here in, in the U.S. So I think that that's really what solidifies um, their, their supporters. It's not the majority but it is a substantial, sizable minority that uh, is loyal to their leader. Um, now, in, in the case of Netanyahu, that's changed in the last year. Um, I think that uh, all the polls I've seen, at least, show that uh, he would uh, have a practically impossible, uh, impossible time forming a coalition. But these changes result not from the corruption investigations, Nothing to do with the trial, nothing to do with the allegations against them, and everything to do with the ongoing um, split in society over the judicial overhaul plans that he has been pushing. That's really kind of changed some minds uh, among more independent voters and even among um, close to a third of Likud party voters, and that's his party, of course. Okay. Yeah, I want to get to that judicial overhaul really quickly. Guy, despite Netanyahu's legal woes, as we said in November, last November 2022, he did lead a far right coalition to win the majority of the 120 seats in Israel's legislature, the Knesset. So you mentioned that there are lots of parts of of his campaigning that have to do with being against things, being against the deep state. Uh, being somebody who's you know against the media, being being anti this and that, this far right coalition that his Likud party has put together. What is it about the coalition's platform or stance on policy issues that is attractive to Israeli voters? Is it being against things, or are there things that they are for? His victory last November, I think, was less about his policy stances, less about Likud's positions, and and more about the uh, electorate just having grown tired of the political instability that's paralyzed Israeli politics Mm -hmm. and society for years now. I mean, this was the fifth election in three and a half years, in less than four years. And um, and so they they witnessed a caretaker government that was led by uh, Naftali Bennett and Yair Lapid. and it lasted longer than I think most uh, pundits thought it would last. But still, it was uh, unstable from, from day one because it was such a diverse coalition with uh, disparate voices, but only had a razor-thin majority. So it, it, was, it was only a question of time before it would collapse. Um, also, uh, when you look at the last election, we see that more voters from the periphery voted, and that favors Netanyahu and their religious right bloc, you had a higher uh, turnout in the last election than in uh, the other four rounds. Um, And another difference uh, was the failure of the small left-wing parties to unite. Despite all the advice they were given, um, they Mm -hmm. decided to kind of run separately. This was a decision made by the Labor Party leader. And so that split the votes and left one of the left-wing parties, the Merits Party, out of the Knesset for the first time. And so that also mm-hmm. played to the right's favor. I mean, had Merritt's uh, made it into the Knesset and they were very close, um, it would have been the same kind of uh, stalemate that we'd seen in the previous four rounds. Mm-hmm. He did get that majority. And this past July, the Knesset, as you mentioned, passed a judicial overhaul plan that abolished the reasonableness doctrine, which the Israeli Supreme Court used to evaluate government policies. And Guy, I know that the Israeli government is set up differently than the U.S. government. We have the three branches and the Supreme Court has a very specific role. It's different in Israel. So if you could just give us a little explanation of the role of the Supreme Court in evaluating government policies to begin with, why this overhaul is so significant and why the legislature was pushing for this. Yeah, so this is really the issue, uh, the issue that's tearing Israeli society apart. And uh, 
and this is the issue about which the, the president of Israel is warned could even lead to a civil war. So proponents of the judicial overhaul, so Netanyahu and his, uh, and his coalition partners, essentially, they believe that the High Court of Justice, which is Israel's Supreme Court, has disproportionate power in Israel, that it is stronger than uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, stronger than other Supreme Courts elsewhere. And they tend to espouse a majoritarian view of democracy. Mm -hmm. You know, we were elected by the people and therefore we've been given a mandate to do as we see fit. And they view elected institutions such as the courts, uh, but that can extend also to media outlets and NGOs, for example, uh, they view that as uh, these unelected institutions as less legitimate. Mm. Um, and so they subscribe to a much more illiberal form of democracy that disregards proper uh, checks and balances and that disregards the importance of safeguarding minority rights. And so that's where opponents of the judicial overhaul come in because they see the Supreme Court as a pillar of Israeli democracy and the only real check on the elected officials. There is no constitution in Israel. There is a unicameral legislature. So it's a very different system without the sorts of checks and balances that we have in the US. And so the Supreme Court is the major check on the government and the Knesset. And so opponents of the uh, judicial reforms um, see these judicial reforms as nothing short of a judicial coup. Mm -hmm. And they're concerned about minorities such as the Palestinians and the LGBTQ community and, and other minorities that need the Supreme Court to, uh, to back them up in, in many cases. Um, there have been cases, for example, where the Supreme Court struck down laws that legalized settler homes built on privately owned Palestinian mm -hmm. land. Uh, that's something that the uh, government is clearly interested in, in, in uh, preventing, which is why they want to weaken uh, the court. So demonstrators have been out there 37 consecutive weeks where we've seen uh, as many as 200,000 protesters out on the streets uh, week after week um, defending the court and trying to prevent Israel from becoming another illiberal democracy like Poland and Hungary or worse. And those demonstrations, it, it also seems like something from a, a previous lifetime where demonstrations of that magnitude in a democracy would have had some effect on the leaders, that, that they would have at least thought about it, <laughs> whether or not, oh, so many people really, really think that we are trying to destroy democracy. Maybe we should, you know, take a step. But but that's that's not happening, is it? Or how is the government responding to those protests over time, over thirty seven weeks? Well, Netanyahu the other day said that I uh, I think he might have said this to to Elon Musk, but he said this in the last twenty four hours that the initial uh, reforms, the initial plan was a mistake or was poorly done, and but he backed that initial plan himself, and so I think now he realizes that uh, he really needs to halt. Um, uh, or, at, or at least attenuate the way in which uh, they've been doing this. But um, his key coalition partners and ministers are absolutely intent on going through with these reforms. So I'm not sure if he's going to be able to withstand the pressure from within the coalition uh, itself. He doesn't have an alternative. So if he doesn't, if he's not able to retain his coalition partners, uh, he won't have a government. So I think that's um, uh, very problematic for him. Well, and as you said, he's sort of the ultimate political animal, animal political operator, and he's been able to figure out ways to keep himself in power, including with this far-right coalition. But if the people begin to turn against that, it's sort of like, where does, where does he land? As you and I have talked about before, in Israel, politics and government are inextricably linked with religion. So when we talk about the various segments of religious and secular Jewish Israelis, we talked about the far right, but how are the other segments 
of the Jewish population in Israel aligning or not with Netanyahu's efforts to weaken the judiciary? Well, among the demonstrators, uh, there are definitely some religious demonstrators and there are definitely um, various uh, groups, Mm -hmm. uh, including some Druze and, and others. But for the most part, um it's a Mm -hmm. secular population um and when you look at the primary supporters of these judicial reforms of the judicial overhaul i.e netanyahu's coalition each uh sector has kind of its own vested interest in seeing these reforms through so for the religious zionists who make up the uh, much of the settler community they want to build freely in the west bank and east jerusalem they don't want the restrictions that have been imposed on them by the court, which they see as a nuisance. Um, For the Haredi population, those are the ultra-Orthodox, they object to the Supreme Court uh, having struck down legislation, excuse me, legislation that would exempt them formally from the draft. Um, And so at least up until recently, now they're kind of indicating that they're they're willing to um, suspend some of the more controversial elements of the, of the uh, judicial overhaul package, but but they have until now at least supported uh, these reforms for their reasons. And then Netanyahu himself has a personal interest in weakening the judiciary given his right. own uh, corruption trial. And I would note that in the past, he was a fierce defender of the Supreme Court and gave interviews not just to the Western press, but to the Israeli media, um, doubling down on his support and commitment to preserving a strong and vibrant Supreme Court. So what we're seeing today is very different uh, than the um, than the uh, policies and rhetoric that we heard from Netanyahu in uh, in a previous era. Guys, Ziv, it's time to take five. You, our esteemed guest, get to daydream out loud with five policies or practices you believe would change things for the better. We know Israel is an incredibly important U.S. ally, but the relationship hasn't always been the smoothest when Netanyahu overlaps with a Democratic U.S. president. So what are five policy recommendations for the Biden administration in terms of its response to the Netanyahu government's controversial actions? Well, first, since the U.S.'s relationship is based not only on shared interests, but also on common values, it's vital that the administration continues to remind Netanyahu both privately and publicly that democratic values are a pillar of a U.S.-Israel relationship. Second, the administration should complement this rhetoric by conditioning a White House invitation on suspending the contentious judicial overhaul legislation as well as a commitment by the Netanyahu government to honor the decisions made by the Israeli Supreme Court. Third, the White House should also call out extremists in the Israeli government, making it clear that any government minister who makes racist pronouncements will be barred from visiting the United States. Fourth, building on the momentum of the Abraham Accords by encouraging normalization between Israel and the Arab states, such as Saudi Arabia, yet without avoiding the question of self-determination for the Palestinians. And finally, although resuming Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking is probably unrealistic at this time, the administration should make it clear that the U.S. continues to back the two-state solution and urge both sides to refrain from hateful rhetoric as well as unilateral actions, such as the expansion of settlements in the West Bank, which undermine the solution. Thank you. And what about the role of Israel's Arab minority, the Palestinians, in this protest movement or in, in uh, speaking out against this reform? What, where, where have they been? Well, they haven't really been out there at the demonstrations because the Arab community uh, and, and Palestinian citizens of Israel feel largely marginalized and neglected um by the rest of the population and by uh, israeli society and not just the government and they have kind of a more ambivalent view towards the supreme court because at Mm -hmm. times 
the Supreme Court has actually sided with the settlers. They don't always side with the Palestinians. And so they've kind of felt left out of this entire debate. Hmm. That's a it's a pretty large slice of the population to feel like they either don't have a stake in it or to feel that there's no way for them to exercise that stake, to, right. you know, to feel that to feel that disenfranchised. You mentioned uh, the uh, population of Orthodox Jews who have tried to become exempt from military service. It is pretty well known, I think, that national military service is, is mandatory for all Israeli citizens over the age of 18. I think for a lot of people who didn't know that, the actress who played Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot, uh, Israeli, had, and mm-hmm. it was known that she had done her, her service in the Israeli military. So I think a lot of people may have heard that, younger people, for the first time. But lately, relations between the military and Netanyahu's government have been tense. We saw tensions escalate after the judicial overhaul was passed, as you mentioned. So in a country where national military service is mandatory, how is the tension impacting morale in the military? Uh, And, you know, what does that mean in a country where everyone has to serve and everyone has served? that tension? And are there concerns mounting over national security in Israel, which still has its location that it it always has to be aware of to protect its national security? How's all this impacting the military and those relations? Very significantly. And um, we have seen many, many, many reservists um, at these demonstrations. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a 60 Minutes episode the other day focusing on uh, one of the groups that uh, is composed of kind of elite uh, reservists who are uh, protesting um, these judicial reforms. But it's definitely affected morale. We've never seen this before. Um, over 10,000 reservists have threatened to uh, stop showing up for duty. And uh, hundreds of reserve officers from the most um, elite units, uh, intelligence units, including cyber intelligence units, Air Force pilots, other special operation, uh, operations units have uh, announced that they're not going to uh, report for duty. And, um, and so all this affects not just uh, morale, but the IDF's operational readiness. And these are pilots, for example, who are sent on the most dangerous missions in Gaza and, and elsewhere. And so it does leave Israel vulnerable to its enemies like Hezbollah and Lebanon. And, um, and that is very worrisome to the uh, heads of the uh, in- intelligence community and the uh, IDF chief of staff. And so um, tensions are very, very high uh, at the moment. And Netanyahu's own defense minister has expressed great concern over this. Um, uh, about half a year ago, Netanyahu fired him after he expressed concerns, uh, reservations about the uh, reforms, the judicial reforms, and then he had to reinstate him after uh, massive spontaneous demonstrations broke out in support of the defense minister. So this is a very, very problematic uh, in term as far as the uh, IDF is concerned and its readiness to deal with uh, the ongoing threats uh, Israel's facing. Guy, sometimes for the last question, I ask our guests to try to tell the future, which isn't fair. But for you, fortunately, you have a book coming out that's titled Netanyahu versus the Generals, the Battle for Israel's Future. So you sort of have a jump start on the premise of trying to uh, discern the future for Israel. Can you give us a sneak preview of your book? Just a you know a little bit about what we could expect. What is Netanyahu versus the Generals? So. Netanyahu, ever since entering politics, Netanyahu has cultivated a self-image as Israel's Mr. Security. And this is a reputation that until this past year, actually, resonated with large swaths of the Israeli public. And, uh, and that includes even, uh, even many of his critics. And, and that's really enabled him to uh, remain prime minister, to become Israel's longest serving prime minister. Um, Yet, paradoxically, the security community in Israel has long questioned Netanyahu's leadership style and his approach to national security. And so uh, I find this kind of an intriguing 
paradox and and I explore it and I also explore the uh, underlying reasons behind the uh, public's inattention to the collective judgment of hundreds of ex generals and former spy masters. I interviewed uh, many of them for this project, mm-hmm. um, and and many of them um, spoke pretty freely about their um, concerns over Netanyahu's policies towards the Palestinians, towards uh, Iran, uh, and its quest for for uh, nuclear uh, weapons, mm-hmm. and, um, and and what. I found really resonated among, uh, well, what is now resonating among the general public that wasn't resonating until this year was this kind of question over whether Netanyahu is looking out for uh, the nation's uh, interests or whether he's looking out for his own interests. And I think many, um, many among his own supporters or his former supporters are now reaching the conclusion that the security community reached a while ago, which is that he tends to place his personal and political interests above the national interests. And that I think is of deep concern to them as is um, their uh, primary objective, which is the, to maintain and, and realize the Zionist vision of an Israel that is both Jewish and democratic, and they feel that that is under threat, uh, in part, in large part, because of Netanyahu's leadership. And you mentioned earlier that Netanyahu was reelected, and and there was almost a sense of fatigue or weariness on behalf of the Israel Israeli public because they'd had such instability. They had a caretaker government, and it, it almost seems as though it was like, okay, whatever, you've done it before do it again, just just be in charge. And I know it wasn't that simple, but that's kind of the sense of we just want some stability. So at some point, Israel does have to have a future that doesn't include Benjamin Netanyahu. So what in your book can we expect to learn about not just Netanyahu's future, but also Israel's future? Well, I think that uh, one of the areas that I focus on uh, in the book that I think is relevant, obviously, to Israel's future is this kind of notion of um, having a state that is secure um, and that is democratic and that is um, also still Jewish. And here we're entering also uh, the demographic question. And we're entering, uh, and we're also thinking about difficult questions about territory and what it means to maintain to retain uh, territory at the price of uh, of remaining a uh, state that is Jewish and democratic. And this is kind of at the heart of the debate um, in Israel, and or at least was at the heart of the debate in Israel. Although the Palestinian topic has largely subsided from public discourse, it still is very much foremost on the minds of, um, of, of you know, retired senior members of the security community who want to see some variation of the two-state solution um, and want to see Israel take steps that can at least keep the two-state solution alive, even though it is unrealistic to expect uh, peace talks to resume anytime soon. Um, but this kind of notion that um, their goal, their mission is to fight for uh, Israel's democracy um, has uh, an entirely new meaning this, this past year, given the, um, given the uh, judicial uh, overhaul plans of this current government. And so that ties in to the kind of general theme that I emphasize uh, in this book. Guy Ziv, thank you for joining Big World and helping me understand what's going on in Israel. As always, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. My pleasure. Big World is a production of the School of International Service at American University. Our podcast is available on our website, on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. If you leave us a good rating or a review, it'll be like a Starburst bag that only has pinks and reds. Our theme music is It Was Just Cold by Andrew Codeman. Until next time. 